Amen. If you want it, it's all right. I want to thank for giving for that beautiful music. And not only the songs beautiful, but they are appropriately named. We are all forgiven. And that ought to be reason to sing. Amen. I want to thank them again. I, I heard that they were working on singing for us, and I've been waiting for their Ipsy SCA 11 o'clock service debut. Amen. And I hope that there will be many more times where they will come and bless us with such beautiful music. Are you glad to be in God's house today? Amen. It's a blessing to be here. I was listening, and uh, all of those who did preliminary jobs today have done such a good job that I don't have any announcements I need to make. Amen. Let's keep them in mind as they have been presented. Amen. Now, sometimes when you do it, you make a risk. It's always good for the old man of the house to come back and re reiterate a few things for our remembrance. But I will trust that you will read the bulletin. <laughs> Remember what has been said. And the board show up on time tomorrow. <laughs> Amen. All righty. Would you bow your heads with me for a word of prayer? Father God, without thee, we are helpless. But our hearts have been encouraged today already by what has gone on, your presence, your power in our worship service, in the songs that we have seen, in the songs that we have heard, in the beauty of welcoming and blessing another child into your congregation and to families. And now, Lord, as we come aside to study your word, to hear a word from you, disappoint us not. Draw near to your people. Let the Holy Ghost have his way as we contemplate things divine. Teach us in the ways of righteousness, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My message this morning is entitled Old O W E D to the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> Ode to the Da Vinci Code. I need to tell you when I before I say anything else that I never intended to preach on the Da Vinci Code. See, as a high school student and in college, I had to do a, a paper. You know how papers are. There are very few that you remember. <laughs> I remember this one. A teacher assigned me, or either I was studied and got the topic, of comparing two of the greatest geniuses of the Renaissance, Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. And, and it was a good paper if I must say so myself. <laughs> I enjoyed writing it, and, and I just discovered a lot of things about the artfulness and the, the inventiveness and the genius of these two men. And at the end, I think I concluded that Leonardo was the greatest of the two. So over the time, I've had a, a one ear attached to anything that has to do with Leonardo da Vinci, and I discovered that Leonardo was, in my terms, my terms only, a bit of a cat. I had heard long before the code came out that he had the practice of encoding certain things in his paintings. He was a bit of the cat, for you see, some of you may not realize, but there's a lot of evidence. Artists have studied and art historians have studied and said that the reason why the smile on the Mona Lisa is so intriguing is that, Mo that Leonardo put his face in the Mona Lisa, that's really him. What type of a man would do something like that? And then I had an interest in the Shroud of Turin. It's not my purpose today to talk about it, but if it is a forgery, many people say that the only genius of the Renaissance who had enough skill to pull it off was Leonardo da Vinci. And that it is his face that is really the face of Christ on the shroud. Now, I don't know if these things are true, but over time, it, it seems like the name of Leonardo was connected with a lot of shenanigans. <laughs> so when I heard about the Da Vinci Code, I said, oh, that's just another one of those so-and-so coded things. This too shall pass. And so as it came time to just decide what I was going to preach this morning, I became aware that the premiere of the movie, The Da Vinci Code, was just yesterday, Friday, May 
19th, I believe it was. And it was all in the news, and I was determined to ignore it and maybe just say a few words in passing this morning about it while I talked about another subject until tooling up and down the television channels, you know us men and the remote, I heard somebody say that over in England they took a survey and for those who read the Da Vinci Code, 60% believed one of the assertions of the book that Jesus Christ was married. So I began to do a little research to see what the impact was. And true enough, as they did surveys about the impact of the Da Vinci Code, that many people have been swayed in their beliefs regarding it. People have paid more attention than I hope you will see this morning that it's due about it and it's causing a furor in the Christian world and in the secular world. According to surveys, we're doing a little bit better in America in being dissuaded by this book. But nonetheless, over 46 million copies have been sold. In the United States, they say that most Americans believe the Bible over the Da Vinci Code. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Among those who have read it, by the way, about 43% of Americans say they have read it, those in the survey. 60% believe that the Bible is closer to the truth, while 10% believe that the Da Vinci Code is more truthful. So I said, I cannot totally ignore this. Something is owed to the Da Vinci Code. This morning, I thought we might just take a brief look, I'm aware of the time, about what this book says and what it means to us as Christians today. Can you say amen? amen? Before I go further, just in case you haven't heard, what is it and why has it had such great impact? Well, the book The Da Vinci Code is a novel that stars a Indiana Jones-type character whose name, last name is Langdon, who discovers that the church through murder and cover-up, has been lying to the world for centuries. A direct line from the opening part of Da Vinci Code. This character says, almost everything our fathers taught us about Christ is false. Strange and powerful assertions. You see, he seems to have discovered in this book that the real holy grail of the church is not the, the greatest secret of the church. It's not a, a cup that Jesus might have drank in at the Last Supper, but that Jesus was not divine, that he had an affair with and married Mary Magdalene, and that their bloodline or their descendants still exist in the world today. Startling, is it, to think that according to this book, you could be sitting next to the great, 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 great grandson of Jesus. The author is a man by the name of Dan Brown. And what does the author say about this book? I'm putting things in perspective right now. In an interview with Entertainment Weekly, he said this, when asked the question, Why do you, what do you make of all the controversy the book has generated? People saying it's all untrue. He says two things. A controversy is to be expected, and of course, it's welcomed. Whether someone agrees or disagrees with these ideas, at least we're talking about them, and that can only be good. Here's the key point. He himself, the author, makes. It's important to remember that this is a work of fiction. All the references in the book, whether it's documents or secret society, all of that information, notice how he puts it, is drawn from fact. Did not say based on fact. Did not say was fact. 
is drawn from fact. All of that information is drawn from fact. But anyone, the author's words, who turns to popular fiction as some sort of historical textbook, well, I don't think anybody is doing that. Oh, but many people are. I run into people who said to me, I used to believe in Christianity, but I read the Da Vinci Code. It's a work of fiction. Can we keep that in mind, everybody, as we go forward? So another question was asked, and so after this interview, the Da Vinci Code is done for you? The author laughs and said, it's going into a hermetically sealed vault. The rest of the world can keep talking about it, but I am moving on. So it starts out as a work of fiction. It's a novel. It is not true. How can a book who is not true have such an impact on our society? People are talking about it. I'm even preaching about it. It's on the news. Some of you are going to sneak off and go see it. <laughs> Few of us will wait until it comes out on DVD. How can it have such an impact? Well, this book is tailor-made for our times. We live in a postmodern time where people believe that there are no absolute and they're on the search for a non-divine religion that they can control. And if Jesus was really just a man, we got a family jack like you and me, then he is the author of a religion that does not to call us to the judgment bar of a divine God, but we bow down before another man if we want to. If he was just like us, we can pick and choose the things in Christianity that we have to do, if it's a fabricated religion based on lies, then it has no more power over us. It presents to us a human Christ we can control. And in these times, people, there are a lot of people who have been looking just for that. And that's one reason it has such a great impact. It appeals to the lie that Christianity has oppressed women as a part of its teachings as a part of his teachings. Sadly, it has been a part of our practice. Oh, mighty quiet in here today. Huh? Sometimes we've done our sisters wrong. But I don't think we lied about Mary Magdalene. <laughs> Some people have said, assessing the book, that 10% of it's factual, 90% is non-factual. But it presents to us a controllable, ordinary God like y'all, <laughs> like me, that no one should fear but only worship if you want to. So what is really owed to the Da Vinci Code? Well, some degree of thankfulness. We owe the Da Vinci Code a little thankfulness because it reveals how the devil works. We know that one of the devil's main tactics is to mix a little truth with a whole lot of error or vice versa. Either way, it's a deadly concoction you ought to loathe to drink. But that's what he has done. Talking about the historicity, let me talk a little bit about some of the, the errors, the truth and errors mixed in the Da Vinci Code. Talking about the historicity of the book, whether or not historically accurate, one academician is quoted by John Ortberg as saying, it's the only book I know that when you read it, you are dumber than when you start it. That's a bold statement. <laughs> Let's take one of the major assertions, Jesus was married. We know that the weight of the scripture was that Jesus was single. And when you do what many have been done, a fact check, you see that the book bases a lot of its assertions on some old, non-canonical, that means they were rejected by the church long ago, Gnostic Gospels. Gnosticism was a belief in the old days that, that flesh was evil, that Jesus, because he was flesh, really wasn't here, but he was a spirit, right? 
It glorified sexuality and all of that stuff. And so there were some people who were Gnostic who took the teachings of the Old Testament and weaved them in with Gnostic doc doctrines and called them gospels. Well, they're not really gospels. They're false writings. But this author, Dan Brown, bases a lot of it on those gospel, those Gnostic writings. And one of them is the Gospel of Philip, written over 200 years after the rest of the gospels were written. So Sir Johnny come lately. And he finds a text upon which, in, these, in this Gnostic gospel, upon which he bases the idea that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married. The text says something like this. And the companion of Jesus was Mary Magdalene. He loved her more than the other disciples, and he kissed her on the mouth. <laughs> well, if he kissed her on the mouth, they must have been close. Therefore, the disciples knew, and everybody else knew, except the church who covered it up and buried it and killed people so you wouldn't discover it that Jesus was married. Well, if you actually go to the original manuscript of the Gospel of Philip, you see that that text leaves a lot to be desired. I will read it to you as it appeared. For you see, in a lot of the text, words or holes in the text appear, and you really don't know what the writer is saying. I will read it as it is. It says, and the commandment of blank, Mary Magdalene blank, her more often, blank, the disciples, blank, kiss her, blank, on her. Shall I read it again? <laughs> and the companion of, blank, Mary Magdalene, blank, her more often than, blank, the disciples, blank, kiss her, blank, on her, blank. So what the author did was fill in a lot of stuff. If there was many holes in any other text of scripture, would you believe it? Could you really tell what it was talking about? And yet he takes this statement and says that this statement from the gospel of Philip, a Gnostic gospel rejected as not bearing the truth that is verified by the rest of the Old Testament and New Testament, asserts that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married. He makes a lot of the word companion, which in one language, Aramaic, means wife or spouse. But he fails to tell you that this section was not written in Aramaic. It was written in Coptic, an Egyptian language, which borrowed the word from the Greek. And the word there means co-worker, companion, someone who you're close to, right, that you work with. Does not mean spouse. Yet he uses this as a, one of his strongest evidences of saying that Jesus was married. If that were true, Paul was dealing with a controversy. If you have your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians 9, verse 5. Jesus really was married. And you know that Paul, from the scriptures, was single. Amen? Amen. He may have been married before he got the call. But he lived and told all of the disciples and all of the people in the New Testament, it's better if you're going to serve the Lord if you're single. Because if you're married, you're worried about the things of this world. Right? He said, if you're married, husbands worry about how to please the wife. Say amen, wives. Wives didn't say amen. Husbands, y'all got some work to do. <laughs> And he goes on to say, if you're married, wives, worry about how to please the husband. Say amen, husbands. Amen. 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 See, the wives are doing a better job. Men, y'all need to do better, okay? But he goes on and continues with the other controversy of saying, now, marriage is not bad. And 1 Corinthians 9, verse 5, he says, don't we all have the right to lead around a sister or a wife? And he goes on to mention some people like James, the brother of Jesus. Evidently from the gospel, James was married. His wife went with him in the, in the evangelistic fields, right? And he mentions others. Now, if Jesus was married, why didn't he say, and like Jesus, who married Mary Magdalene, but is totally missing from the gospel and any other writings. So we can only say 
that this assertion of the Da Vinci Code is a pure and complete fabrication. Jesus was not married. So you're not sitting next to one of the great, 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 great grandsons <laughs> or daughters of Jesus. Can you say amen? amen? And so many other things about the gospel is fabricated or taken out of context. He says, among other things, that, have you heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? He said that the Dead Sea Scrolls is an early Christian writing. Hmm. Look at the facts. The Dead Sea Scroll discovered in a cave up in the mountains a long time ago when a shepherd boy was throwing rocks into a cave. Instead of hearing a thud, he heard some vases break. Went inside and discovered that some of the Jews from long ago, who? The Jews from long ago had stored in that cave for safekeeping some of their ancient writings. Some of them was the laws and the regulations of the Qumran community. Some were copies of the book of Isaiah and other Old Testament writings. Did you get that? The Dead Sea Scrolls are not Christian writings. They are Jewish Old Testament writings. None of them ever mention Jesus Christ. They are important to the Christian church because the Dead Sea Scrolls, which turned out to be written earlier than many of the copies of the Old Testament that we have, proved to be so accurate about the Bible. The copies and the words that were written in the, the Dead Sea Scrolls was very close to the Bible that you and I have today. So it affirmed the accuracy of the Old Testament, but it is not a New Testament writing. It doesn't say anything about Jesus, maybe to prophesy that he's coming. You know, Isaiah 50, 51, 52, 53, and on that 55, talk about the coming of the Messiah, right? But it is not a Christian writing. In the book, it is proffered as such. No wonder the academician and the historian said, it's the only book I know that when you read it, you're dumber when you finish <laughs> than when you start it. But it's the devil's trick to always mix truth with error. I'm so thankful that we can have, through the work of the Holy Spirit, a knowledge about what is truth and what is not. Can you say amen? amen. Then we learn from the Da Vinci Code, we owe it a word of thanks because it tells us the devil's deception in his attempt to malign the church and circumvent it's truthful doctrines. The church is maligned in one way especially. When we face a controversy and we respond badly. We respond in an unchristian manner. We are defending the faith. But we respond in such a way that the larger society thinks we're being negative, narrow, unreasonable, and censorious. You know what that means? Christians cut off other people's debate. All they want you to hear is what they believe. Huh? Right? Now, I wish the only thing out there was the truth. Say amen. <laughs> but we live in society in a side time that says there is freedom of speech and of the press. Right? And of the novels and of the movies. Would you be surprised to know that Christians have sponsored publicly and said that we ought to boycott the book and the movie, right? Some have even tried to get their national governments in India and in Malaysia to prevent the movie from coming in. There are movements in the United States to do other, other things. I read on the internet about an other cot, not a boycott, an other cot. <laughs> that means that there are other good movies opening up. Don't go see the Da Vinci Code. Encourage all your friends to see the other movie, other cot it. You know, not might, be, might not be a bad idea. But in reality, when we react badly to the controversies that are presented before us, we malign ourselves as being too narrow-minded for the rest of the world to listen to. Are you with me? There's a television show on some channel. I think it's Oprah's channel. I only saw it once or twice. It's called Girls Behaving Badly. <laughs> Why are y'all laughing? It's a show. <laughs> I better explain this. It's a show 
sort of like Candid Camera, where they played tricks on unsuspecting people, most of them pretty clean and decent, but it's only perpetrated by women. And most of us men and other folk wouldn't think that a girl would come up to you and say that there is a snake in your shake. But they do, so it's a funny show, right? We get in trouble when the devil tricks us into be Christians behaving badly. Are you with me? So we have to be careful how we respond to these things. We should have an open mind, and as we shall see later, there is plenty of evidence, if you know the word and what you believe, to refute even the sharpest deception of the devil. I need to tell you that when you really examine it, what is owed to the Da Vinci Code is the knowledge and the, uh, acknowledgement that this has been one of the easy deceptions of the devil. Any work that is 90% false, we ought to be easily able to handle. Are you with me? Amen. We have not yet gotten to the deceptions that might deceive the very elect. Huh? The reason I'm talking about this this morning is some of the people you might meet might not know what you know. But I need to ask you, do you know it? Huh? See, the devil gets us in, in the, 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 the vacancies, the, the vulnerabilities of our lives. And a lot of us as Christians know a lot about our doctrines, but we know very little about our history. Right? We don't know how we got to this point. How many Christians in the audience today will be able to sit down and tell somebody? You don't have to have chapter and verse, but a general outline of how the Bible that we have came into being. Right? One of the assertions of the Da Vinci Code was that there were evil men, Constantine among them, who had 80 Gospels to choose from. They only chose four. And they suppressed and did away with all the others. You know why they did with all the others? Most of them were Gnostic and they were full of errors. It wasn't that the church was trying to suppress it, but looking at the broad span of history, the cohesion. The coherency and cohesiveness of the Old Testament and New Testament, some writings just did not stack up. They were full of false teachings and errors. That's why they were rejected, not because somebody back there in Constantine's day was trying to pull the wool over your eyes. And by the way, it can be proven historically that Constantine had nothing to do with setting the canon of determining what's in the scriptures, another false assertion of the Da Vinci Code. Are you with me? So you have to know what you know and present it in a loving way with open-mindedness. If it's the truth, it can stand. I'm fond of saying, Jesus don't need you to defend him. <laughs> if it's truth, it's going to stand. But you have got to know what's truth. Are you with me, saints? Then the, the devil works Sometimes, second way, malign the, the malign the church by helping us to act badly or malign the truths that we teach. Let me read you a quote from the Da Vinci Code that should be a lot of, of, lot of interest to us Sabbath keepers. See if you disagree or agree with this statement. Da Vinci Code, page 232 and 33. See, in the book he asserts that there is nothing original in Christianity Everything else was borrowed from some other religion, okay? He says, including the doctrine of the resurrection, because there were other religions that taught that their God raised from the dead on the third day. He also says, even Christianity's holy day was stolen from the pagans. Originally, Langdon said, now this is the main character in the story, Christianity honored the Jewish Sabbath. But Constantine shifted it to coincide with the pagans' veneration of the day of the sun. He paused, grinning, Langdon did. To this day, most churchgoers attend services on Sunday morning with no idea that they are there on account of the pagan sun god's weekly tribute Sunday. You agree with that? When you study history, it is true. We just had Ten Commandments Day a couple of weeks ago, right? Right smack dab in the middle of the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shut that lame and all that work. You know that one. We can say it by heart. Say it every week, don't we? Right? 
How did we get to the other day? Constantine did have something to do with it, right? Okay? And we know that it had influence because of the resurrection. People started keeping the first day because of the resurrection. People wanted to be, the early Christians wanted to be differentiated from the other early Christians. You could look in the book of Acts 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 and see that the early Christians worshipped on the Sabbath. But as time went on, by the end of the, the first century, about 100 years after Christ, Sunday has started creeping into the church. And Constantine made the first law. If you've ever been to an Adventist evangelistic crusade, you know that we say this verbatim. Then nobody say amen. Somebody say amen. amen. History backs this up. But how is the truth maligned? You see, the devil let out a little bit of truth in one of the most Christianity vilified novels in the history of the church. 99% of the Christians would reject this simply because it's in the Da Vinci Code. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Ain't he slick? <laughs> For those who never heard about the Sabbath, they might hear this, but it's given in the context of saying that the church who's supposed to tell the truth has been lying to y'all for all these years. So they too have been inoculated against the Sabbath. One of the devil's things is to circumvent and get to people before you get there with false ideas about the truth you're about to present. What does that say? Church, wake up and be about your father's business. We are in a race for souls and the devil ain't playing. Are you with me? Yeah. Jesus wants to go out and win as many people as possible. And while we sit here, twiddling our thumbs, he's out there poisoning minds against the truth. But the truth, no matter when it's told, is still the truth. <laughs> and somebody's going to believe it. Can you say amen? And we ought to be able to say to others clearly why we believe that that fourth commandment still is binding and prove it from scripture, no matter what the devil puts out there. I've told you before, I read a long time ago in the Insight magazine, this quotation has always stuck with me. Jesus is coming soon, but the devil is coming first. <laughs> Are you with me? So we ought to be about our father's business. So we let other people know that there is this authority. And we owe the Da Vinci Code a vote of thanks for being a wake up call for those of us who are asleep. But more than that, we owe the Da Vinci Code a vote of thanks for turning us to the scriptures to see that the things we have taught for years are true. Let me go back to our verse. Did you remember the scripture reading we had this morning? Ephesians 4. I'm about to conclude the fourth chapter, verse 10 through 14. I want to read it to you from West's expanded translation of the New Testament. If you have it, say amen. And the Bible says, the one who descended himself is also the one who ascended above all the heavens in order that, all, that he might fulfill all things. Point number one, the Bible asserts and history asserts that Jesus is divine and that Christianity believed it long before Constantine called a council to, according to the Da Vinci Code, change the teaching from the human nature of Jesus to the divine nature. The disciples believed it from the moment he stepped out of the tomb. That was the thing that finally convinced him that this was no ordinary man. This was no ordinary rabbi. He is the one. He's the one that came down, and he has ascended on high. He is divine. We have not followed cunningly devised fables, but we believe in a God who rose from the dead. And Paul says, if Christ be not risen, we above all people are most miserable, for we have no hope if our 
originator did not rise from the dead, how are you going to rise from the dead? But because there is an empty tomb somewhere over there in Jerusalem, it is the seal and the proof that we worship the one true God, a divine Savior named Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Amen. Goes on to say, and he gave him gave himself, and he himself gave some, on the one hand as apostles, on the other hand as prophets, and still again some as bringers of good news, and finally some as pastors who are also teachers for the equipping of the saints for the ministry work with a view to the building up of the body of Christ. God has equipped his church to deal with the errors and sinfulness of our times. Jesus did not leave us without resources. He did not leave us without help. We are equipped, and God's goal for us, and therefore what should be our goal for ourselves, it says to be mature Christians. It says he's going to build up the body of Christ, and I continue, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, listen to this, of the experiential, full, and precise knowledge of the Son of God through a spiritually mature man. We all can grow up. We don't have to be afraid. Because he says that we grow into the full measure of Christ in order that we no longer may be immature ones, the Bible says children, tossed to and fro and carried around in circles, by every wind of teaching in the cunning adroitness of men, in craftiness, which furthers the scheming deceitful art of error. Oh boy, if I had time, I'd preach another sermon called The Art of Error. But that's what we have to deal with in these last days. Are you ready? Do you feel ready? If you don't feel ready, it's time to get ready because it's coming. I do not set myself up as a prophet or the son of one. I don't have any more knowledge. God is not giving me more insight about what's going to happen tomorrow. But my, my sense about what's going on is that we are moving fast toward that time when deception is going to come thicker and faster. We're moving fast toward that time where we're going to move from ideas that deceive to miracles that deceive. And if large portions of our population are swayed by a book that the author admits is fiction, what are they going to do when the evil spirits start performing miracles on the 6 o'clock news? Huh? Deeper question, what are you going to do? Do you know there's going to come a time when Christians will not be able to believe their eyes? Just the word of God. Well, didn't you see him make him float through the air? Didn't you see him heal that person who was dying of sickness? A group of his followers walked on water. They said Jesus is in the secret place out in the desert. I went there and he healed everybody. He spoke. There was a light surrounding him. He taught many great things. And our only defense will be to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. You won't be able to believe your eyes, let alone your ears. Huh? And so today, we owe the Da Vinci Code a degree of thanks for being a wake-up call for the church for us, especially in this church. The Baptist press put it this way. So rather than protesting the Da Vinci Code, why not invite people to read a better book? The book that tells the dramatic story of God, who sent his son, who lived the perfect life, died on the cross, and who rose again to break a curse, not a code. That's an opportunity we Christians should not miss. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for little signs along the way. We thank you that you reveal to us that this little time of trouble will grow and grow and grow in intensity until the great time of trouble. 
and at the early times before the falling of the latter rain, before things get too intense, that will be the wake up call to your awake and watchful children that is nigh high time to awake out of our sleep so that we be not deceived but, more deceived, but more than that, that we might share the everlasting truth of the three angels' messages with all of those around us before you come again. These things remind us that you're coming soon, sooner than we might think, but let there be no fear in our preparation, only a fervent desire to love you, to be ready, and to serve you that we might hear your well done. For these blessings we ask in the worthy and righteous name of Jesus. Amen. 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 And amen.